Okay, I thank you all to invite me for this presentation. I will uh, show you some guidelines of, uh, of the experience that I have in the plastic industry. My father uh, built the first shop in 1955 in Mexico City, and I was born in 1956. They're direct on the shop. That was the first shop that my father had. In 1958, my father began with the manufacturing of injection machines and molds. So I was two years old when he already made machines for the plastic industry at this time. Then in 68, he decided to stop the manufacturing of, of machines and continue with the molds and began the molding. The molding is to produce the part, the plastic part. And in 1968, I began my first experience in the, in the injection molding with this machine. That was a, a manual injection machine from Italy. And I was 12 years old. I was in the, in the high school when I began, in the junior high school when I began with this, with this process. In 1977, my father won a, an award in Mexico for an important company uh, in the Mexican industry to making a machine for extrusion. I study industrial engineering in Mexico City, and then I made a specialty in plastic technology in Germany in the Süddeutsches Kunststoff Centrum, that is the the South Germany Plastic Center. In 84, my father died in an accident, and after that, my brothers and I, we decided to continue with the shop. That was the shop of my father in 84, and maybe you see uh, in the windows, maybe you see the house. Uh, we continue living together with the shop, so we were involved always with the, with the, with the plastic shop. So after four years, we began to produce technical parts for the maquiladora industry, and that was my first contact with the American market through the maquiladora industry. And we modified a little bit the, the shop. It was in the same place, but we changed some machines, and we, we organized better to be suppliers for the maquiladora industry. That was in 1988. Then in 1993, our suppliers for machinery and the Italian company, Negribosi, invited us to be the agents from Negribosi in Mexico, and we opened a company to distribute machinery for the Mexican territory. After many, many work, in 1997, we built our, our plant in Chihuahua to continue supplying the maquiladora industry. In 2000, I was elected the president of the ANIPAC, the National Association of the Plastic Industry, and I was the president of the Association for Mexico, 2000 and 2001. And in 2001, I was the president from the ALIPLAS. ALIPLAS is the Latin American Society of the Plastic Industry. So I began to know not only the Mexican industry, I knew the, the plastic industry in all Latin America. Colombia, Brazil, Argentina are the most strong countries in plastic. Then during 2002, we decided to close the plant in Mexico City and we consolidate everything in the plant in Chihuahua and we grow the plant in Chihuahua we arrived to 25 injection machines with 200 employees in Chihuahua supplying 100% for the maquiladora. Customers like Honeywell, General Electric, Emerson Electric for the plants that they had in North Mexico. In 2006, uh, after a devaluation of the euro and some commercial problems that we had in Mexico, we decided to close 
the distribution company after 14 years of operation with almost 500 machines sold in Mexico. And in December 2007, we decide after 40 years of, of, of injection molding, sold the company for an American corporate. The name is uh, MG's Manufacturing. That is a company from, from the Michigan area. So they bought us the, the plant in Chihuahua, and we stopped to produce the parts. After the decision of closing Lube and selling the plant, I decided to work like a consultor. And I began to work with PTM, that is a plant from FEMSA. FEMSA has many divisions, but one of the most important divisions is Coca-Cola FEMSA. Coca-Cola FEMSA is the biggest bottler from Coca-Cola on the world, and they attend all the Latin American uh, market for Coca-Cola. So they have a plant in Querétaro, the name is PTM, Plásticos Técnicos Mexicanos, and we began to work like a consultor to them, and in 2006, we developed a modernization project for them with an investment of, of $4 million. And after this experience, uh, I decided to open a company here in McAllen, and in 2007, I founded the Sosa Tech Advisors, like a consulting company for the plastic industry. During 2007, we were together with PTM to develop a plastic pallet for the Coca-Cola plant. And 2007 and 2008, we implemented the production line for this pallet. You will see a video for that a little later. After the result of this technology, I decide to compete in, 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 the, in the most important plastic show in America, that is the MPE show. At this time, the MPE show was in Chicago. The MPE show is held every three years. So in 2009 was the, the first international plastic design competition. In, in, in United States, they had the plastic competition for many years, but in 2009 was the first time that they invite projects from other countries to do international. So to do this pallet, I developed a process, the name is inside injection foaming. And to know if the process is good enough, I decided to go to the show and compete in the, in the competition and see if the technology is, is, is good for the market. And all the, all the people that cal qualified the competition were specialists for many years. And it was a very, very interesting uh, experience. And I won the Packaging and Handling Materials Award in this, in this competition. Then in 2010, after the first competition, I decided to continue with the competition because you travel and you drink and you eat free. <laughs> so I competed in the 22nd DuPont Awards for Packaging Innovation, and we moved to Delaware to join with them the, 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 the awards. And it was a very nice uh, experience. To there, these two guys there with me are the people from, from the plant in, in Querétaro. So after this experience, I continued with the process working in other parts. In 2011, we used the, the inside injection foaming already with a, with a, with a framework, uh, IIF, uh, developing a Coca-Cola crate for the Colombia Fence Operations. This is the crate. And we participate again in the, in the so with the crate now in Orlando was the first plastic show in Orlando, 
but we we don't we don't want at this time okay whatever other products that were better for the jury 2012 and 2013 we were together with ptm to develop a, a pallet reinforced with metal for a very interesting customer in the United States that is an open, open pool company, that is a leasing company for the pallets. That is a concept that is very strong in the United States. There is a company that maybe you know, the name is CHEP, and they have this blue wooden pallet uh, leasing uh, that you see everywhere. So they lease the wooden pallet uh, and was this company, IGPS, was the, the only company that leased plastic pallets. So we worked with them, and we, uh, they accept our design, and we were very, very happy with the pilot production order. But before we began the production, they went in bankruptcy, and we couldn't continue with that. So this project, the stop and and well we are waiting to they recover the other people bought the company and they are trying to recover the company and this year I had another idea to develop a new pallet uh, cheaper than the previous pallets but with the durability that we reach. And I decided to compete again, but in McAllen. So um, uh, we won the McAllen Chamber Innovation Grant this year, so three, four months ago. So the intellectual property that we have, we have, the, we have a patent. This, this patent is already in the United States. This is the number of the patent. We have the process. Uh, the process is already the international publication and is, uh, is pending with the patent in the United States. We are working on that. Then we had the, the crate, the structural box, that is already uh, the international publication done in, in this year, as you see, 2014. And the pallet with the reinforcement was this year, uh, the international publication done already. These patents are in process to continue in different countries. And we have the trademark for the inside injection for me. Before you make me the questions, and I want to show you some videos that I have. Well. Let me try to explain. Uh, the idea of this presentation is not to go in the technical issues, OK? But it's important that you understand this process in general. There is a process, very old process, that is the injection molding. Everybody knows the injection molding. So you produce parts with the injection molding. And a variation of this process is the structural foam. That is an injection, plastic injection, but with low pressure. You put some blowing agent in the material, and you inject in the mold. And inside the mold, the blowing agent expands, and you have a foam part. Okay. So these two different processes, very similar but it's different. The, the first one, the traditional injection molding, works with uh, pressures from 250 to 1,000 bars. And the low pressure is between 20 and 40 bars. So you don't put too much pressure because the foam works for that. When you need a big wall thickness, you use the structural foam. With the traditional, you go until four or five millimeters, OK? So my idea was to combine these two processes, produce a part with the traditional injection with four millimeters walls, OK? 
design the product with a space between the walls, and after that, inject foam inside that. At the end, I had 20 millimeters wall. Four millimeters for the injection, 12 millimeters for the foam, and another four millimeters for the injection. The problem was nobody tried that before, and we don't know what happened with the temperature because you inject the part 220 grads centigrade, that is 450 Fahrenheit, and then you inject the foam at the same temperature, and you don't know how come the deformation and how function the blowing inside the plastic. That was the development that we made. So what is the res what was the result? This is the Ahora sí. Aquí le oh, okay. This is a plastic pallet, an injection plastic pallet, and you see that is an impact test, and you see when you impact the column breaks. That is a structural foam pallet that again if you impact break the pallet. And the next one is with my process. The life of, uh, let me stop. The life of an injection pallet is around 35 trips. The trip is all the, all the way that the pallet works to bring the products to the stores and return and everything. So 35 trips. And a pallet from a structural foam, maybe 40, 45. You don't find any, pa any plastic pallet more than 50 trips live. With this technology, we reach 100 trips. So double against the, pla the traditional plastic. The, the wooden pallet has a life of 18, 15 to 18 trips, but costs less than a plastic pallet. So at the beginning, we thought that we found uh, a gold mine because we say, well, the, the wooden pallet costs $20, 18 trips, that is $1.20 per trip. With, our, with a traditional plastic pallet, $40, 40, 45 trips, 40 trips, or 35 trips, again, is around $1 per trip. But with our pallet that costs a little more, $50, 100 trips cost 50 cents. So we say, we got it. Something that we didn't know is that everybody stole the pallets and everybody <laughs> lose the pallets. So that's the reason we are working in the new development to, to reach a, a, a plastic pallet close to the wooden pallet price with better life. Of course, we don't, we don't, we don't arrive to 100, but we try to arrive to maybe to 40 trips, but with a price of 20 something dollars, okay? And well, we are working on it. I will show you the, the installation to produce this, the, the ultra pallet, that is the, the pallet that, that we are producing for Coca-Cola. Well, they are producing for Coca-Cola. I'm only the consultor, okay? For over 35 years, PTM has focused on developing technology that improves the integrity of our customers' products, facilitating their handling, transportation, and storage. Traditional pallets are made of wood. Despite the low cost of wooden pallets, in a short time, they become an operational problem. <laughs> Wooden pallets have the disadvantage of breaking apart over time. This generates a lot of garbage. And as a result, we spend a lot of time clearing broken pallet pieces from our warehouse floor. In addition to its low resistance to impact, 
and high cost of maintenance, wooden pallets generate moisture, pests, and trash, making them a poor choice for companies focusing on clean, safe, and healthy work environments. An average wooden pallet can only last from 15 to 20 trips in its life cycle. In recent years, plastic pallets have been replacing traditional wooden ones. However, their ability to withstand impacts remains low, resulting in pallets that easily break apart due to the rigors of daily warehouse operations. The average lifespan for plastic pallets is from 30 to 40 trips. PTM developed IIF, a patented technology designed to significantly increase the performance of our pallets through a system of 100% recyclable structural foam. Ultra pallets are injected with a high content of recycled plastic in two parts. Then they are bound together with a snap fit system and reinforced with foam, which increases column's thickness to 20 millimeters. This allows the pallet to function as an integrated platform, multiply its impact resistance, and prevent disassembly. The technology developed by BTM allows us to use high percentages of recycled materials without sacrificing the quality and strength of our material handling products. In addition, our automated processes and the superimposing of the foaming process enables us to reduce production time, increasing our ability to respond to the market. With IIF technology, we have succeeded in increasing resistance to forklift impacts up to five times and breakage due to falls, extending the useful life of the ultra pallets to up to 10 years. Our pallets are subjected to resistance testing in situations such as forklift impacts and drops. The Ultra Pallet has a high capacity for loading static, dynamic, or racking cargo and can be manufactured according to our client's requirements. According to tests conducted in the Virginia Tech Laboratory, they exceeded 90 simulated trips, compared to the plastic pallet industry average of 30 to 40. Considering that the average pallet makes 10 trips per year, wooden pallets can make from 15 to 20 trips, lasting up to two years. Average plastic pallets can make 30 to 40 trips, lasting three to four years. On the other hand, the ultra pallet can make 80 to 100 trips, increasing its lifespan up to 10 years. The ultra pallet is one of our success stories reinforcing our commitment to offer innovative, highly durable, and optimum performance plastic products.
does one pallet take? Sorry? How long does one pallet make? I mean, I imagine those robots are going to work slower than Yeah, we produce 60 pallets per hour. So one pallet per minute. We tried to arrive to 50 seconds, but we need to calibrate everything very good. And you know, you calibrate everything and you begin with 50, but you go and next day they already move the machine and everything. And, and well, however, it's, it's, it's working in a very good production. So this is some of the test of the pallet that is a, a test in the corner. We left falling down the part. If you, if you see the corner flexion, that was something that I didn't know, how function the foam with that. And, and it's very interesting. Flexion, the plastic, and return. And well, that was something, something good. I have a suggestion for you for a product. <clears throat> Instead of going with a cheaper market, go for a more expensive product. Put a GPRS chip with a GPS inside them, possibly just in one in 10. Uh, so people don't know where they are, and sell it to companies that are worried about things being stolen, so they can try their shipment. Yeah, we try to do that, <laughs> but uh, well, this is the last, the last part. Sorry, I, I continue with you. This is the last part of the video, and the other videos that I show you, that I show you the impact, is the same test. But well, you see here the machine to test. Yeah, we try to do that, but we continue uh, uh, studying the market. The market in the United States is just incredible. In the United States, uh, the market size is one billion pallets per year. Ninety-three percent are wood. Ninety-three percent. So more than nine. 100 million pallets are good. And if I show you the surveys and with the question, why you buy wooden pallets, the, the answer is because the price, period. This pallet is working good in Coca-Cola for one reason. They have a closed loop. They have the pallet in the warehouse, in the, in the yard. So they take the pallet, put in the plant inside where they bottle the Coca-Cola. They put the Coca-Cola in the pallet, and they move to another warehouse. Then come the four lips, take these pallets with the, with the Coca-Cola and put in the trucks. And the trucks move to the distribution centers. The distribution centers, they uh, warehouse the, the, the Coca-Cola for some time, came again the four leaf, take the, the pallets and put in the trucks to deliver to the stores. That is a special trucks when they, they don't take the pallet out of the truck or they only take the crates with the Coca-Cola to the stores. So they never, never give the pallet to the customer. But many other companies, they give the pallet to the customer, and that's a problem because the customer, they don't want to be responsible for the pallet. So they prefer to buy the wooden pallet because the wooden pallet costs less, and if the customer don't return the pallet, they don't lose too much money. So yeah, there is some markets that accept this type of pallet, but the big market, is looking for something cheaper, okay? Maybe not as cheap as the wooden pallet, but cheaper enough to support the losses and the and the stolen that they had, okay? Another question? Yeah. Uh, the invention of the 3D printing, how do you think that it's gonna affect or influence the molding with the injection machine? I don't want to answer you wrong. <laughs> Today, the 3D printing is nothing against 
the traditional process. You cannot produce a part, a plastic part with a 3D printer that support the requirements, the physical requirements and the characteristics that you need in a process. But of course it's something good. I don't know in 10 years or in 20 years if we can have 3D printings that really can produce uh, usable also part that you can use. Now, now it's impossible because it's the material that they use is very breakish. So you, you, you can, so you, you don't use pressure so you don't compact the material that you compact in a machine like this, okay? So, however, it's, it's something, it's, it's, well, what can I tell you? you? You are very young. As you see, I'm not so young. <coughs> when I went to Germany to study, uh, we haven't had internet. We haven't had fax. We had only the telephone and the normal mail. And the telephone was very, very expensive. I called to my home two times in two years that I was there because the price of the phone calls internationally. If you ask me, I was in Germany when I was 20 years old, like you. If somebody asked me at this time what I think of a small phone, I will laugh and say, that's impossible. <laughs> and now everybody has one. So I cannot tell you that the 3D printing will be not a success. But now, today, it's, it's not yet uh, a, a, a process for production. Okay? You can do some things. And of course, we use a lot to see the part. Because when you design a plastic part, you, you design in the drawings, and you design in 3D, and you, you don't see the part. And you cannot test how you make the assemble of the parts. Now, with the 3D printing, you can do a prototype and look how it assemble. But to use, or to use this part for tests like this is not possible. Okay? What's the other? Uh, and how's the weight compared to a plastic pallet compared to a wooden pallet? Is almost half. The wooden pallet, the wooden pallet is around 80 pounds, and the plastic pallet is uh, 45, no more than 50 pounds. So did the customers realize that? Yeah. They put more in trucks. Yeah. yeah. This is one of the advantages. Now, and there is another thing very important. The, there is some rules for the workers, and a worker cannot help more than 50 pounds. Okay? And that's, that's, that's good. The problem is that, you know, the wooden pallet industry is very strong. With this market, with these sales, it's very, very strong. So they were very hard uh, with the marketing, with control, the congresses, and you know the, fa the, the fighting between the wooden and the plastic because the recyclability and all these things is really a war. It's, it's a war. It's, it's, it's a market very complicated. But but yeah, at the end, the price is the the most important. Uh, point to the site for the wood. And what, what kind of percentage of markup difference in price for wood and plastic you're manufacturing now? Yeah, the, 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 the wooden pallet is the pen because the, there is different sizes and different uh, characteristics of the pallet, but we can say that it's between 15 and 20 dollars, okay? And a plastic pallet is between 40 and 50 dollars, okay? And the market for the plastic pallet is 2.7% in the United States. There is another pallet that is with cardboard. With cardboard is 3.2%.
that's a very good solution. The problem is what is rainy and this, that's, that's a problem too. So we, we are trying to find a better solution, okay? Everybody likes the characteristics of the plastic, but they don't want to pay the price of the plastic. So we need to reduce the, 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 the material quantity and with this reduction, you can offer a better price. But if you reduce that, you don't, you don't reach the, character, the mechanical characteristics that you need for the load that you will move. So it's a, you know, it's a combination of things that you need to play with. Presumably that's why you put the metal as, an, as a yeah. more structural element. Yeah, yeah the reason of this, of this insert was not to incre increase the weight of the plastic, so reduce, reduce the quantity of the plastic, but supporting the load with the inserts. Okay, good, good observation. Were, yeah. there, were there any other applications that you looked into for the, the, the process that you guys developed? Yeah, uh, as you saw, this, this crate this is a very interesting example. I was in the plant in Colombia, and I saw in the warehouse something very strange. You know, I, I saw the, the, I don't know how you say in English, estivas, where you have all the, 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 the pallets with the product, and they had one, one, one area with four pallets, one over the other. And we have the other with three pallets. And they have a space, even for five. Say, why you warehouse here in, with four pallets and here with three pallets? Why you don't uh, put higher and to, to have more efficiency in your warehouse? And they bring me say, this Coca-Colas are, these bottles are full, and these bottles are empty. So, say, well, that means that you cannot support the weight of the four pallets with the product? No. We can try. Yes, if you want. So we try. When I saw how the, the, the crate flexion when you put the four pallets. So for the reason we designed this crate with the foam in the columns, and the columns support. But even outside of the packing industry, um, in the automotive or? Yeah, the, the thing is we need, we need time to do, yeah, they're, they're, it's not an, it's very, it's very important. This technology is not an universal technology. You need to find the right application for the technology. Because if you need more material inside with the, with the energy that you generate with the injection, you deform the part. So you cannot be, you cannot have more than 12 millimeters of foam, okay? If you don't need the foam, uh, why you need to use the process? So there is almost all the products are designed to work with the normal thicknesses. There is some products that need more thicknesses and there is the, the niche that you can use, but you cannot be very big. There is other processes very interesting that I found. There is a, a process, uh, I don't know if you heard about the process, the name is rotomolding. Rotomolding is some is some a, a big mold that ro rotate and uh, you heat this mold and you put the material inside and begin to plastify and begin to cover the walls well these people invent a process when you put two different materials with two different densities inside and the material with more density goes to the walls, and the material with less density stay in the middle. And they put the blowing agent in the, in the material that stay in the middle. 
and in some moment begins to foam. And they, they can reach walls bigger than 20 millimeters, no less. So we made an arrangement, say, well, if you find a project with, with something that you cannot do because your process uh, gives you more than 20 millimeters, Please call me. You know, if I find a, a project for for something bigger, I call you. So uh, the processes are so okay. Uh, we cannot until we don't have the patent finished. We cannot go with a big marketing for the process. Okay. So the most important mold makers in Europe, uh, the most important machine producers, the producers from the structural foam machines here in the United States know the process, and I know them, and I know the mold makers, and well, they they show me some some projects that we can do, but it's not easy, and the investment is very high investment to do this development is, is, is very high. So you need a big company that can support that, like Coca-Cola. Okay, the production line that you saw there it costs $5 million to, to do the, the production. Have you applied for the patent? Sorry? Have you applied for the patent? Yeah, yeah. I think it's already patented, isn't it? The pilot is already finished the patent. The process is not yet. That is a long history about the patents. <laughs> One day I will tell you, that's incredible. But uh, this logic, because if you are a specialist, you develop something and you send to the patent office, and the guy that made the revision, he's not a specialist. He goes to the internet, finds everything that is similar, and send to you and tell you, you don't have innovation in your process or in your product because there is all these patents. And you need to take every patent, analyze the patent, and tell them, no, 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 that is something different. They are using this other thing. or this. You need to clarify that. So it's a work that really I never imagined. So I began with the patents in 2008. We are in 2014. Now I am a specialist in patents too. <laughs> what was the one of your major challenges at making a product like specialized for for any company? Convincing the company to make the investment. If you give me the money, I do the part. Don't worry. <laughs> the problem is convince them to do that. Not. In more in Latin America, it's more difficult there because there is not the mentality for the innovation. In the United States, is one of the reasons I'm here is better. But it's not easy to find somebody that wants to invest uh, in this type of, of, of developments that, as I told you, are expensive. Okay. Thank you. I will, I will pass you some brochures for the technology, okay, only for reference. I have always been very interesting in the, in the community where I live. Now I live here. So I offer you, and the reason to be here is that I offer you free advising if you need some uh, support for plastic technology, some knowledge of plastic technology, feel free to contact me. Uh, by phone or by email, and I will be very happy to support you with your ideas and with your projects, okay? Excellent. Thank you very much.